Well, guess what book of the Bible we're in today? We're in Mark. If you didn't know that, that's because you're new. Today is the 60th sermon in our study through the book of Mark that we are calling the simple gospel because, let's be honest, life can sometimes be complicated, but here at Redemption, we want to make the gospel very simple. And so, for the last few years, we've been studying through the book of Mark, and there's a couple of reasons why we've done this. The first reason is Mark literally is the simple gospel. It is the shortest, it is the most precise, succinct gospel out of the four gospels. It just lets you know exactly who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and what it means for us to live our lives for Jesus. So Mark is action-packed. It is fast-paced. 42 times he says the word immediately because that's his favorite word. Jesus did this. Jesus did that. Bing, bang, boom, bada, boom. Here's who Jesus is. That's his whole goal, is to get you to Jesus as fast as possible. And so that's one reason, because we want you to know who Jesus is. But the second The second reason we chose to do the book of Mark is because we noticed early on that there's a lot of new believers who are coming to our church. A lot of people who are coming to church for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time, and they didn't really know who Jesus is. Our church is growing through conversion growth. That's why when you walk in, you saw 200 locks on the baptism wall outside. Those are people who have met Jesus. The majority of them have actually got saved during our study through the book of Mark. And out of all of that, we realize there's a lot of people in our church who don't know how to read the Bible for themselves. So when we do expositional preaching, verse by verse through books, we do it so that way you can learn how to read it and to apply it into your own life. And whether it's through small group discussions or personal devotions, we realize that there's a lot of people who struggle when it comes to understanding the Bible. Now, let's just be honest. How many of you kind of sometimes struggle when it comes to understanding the Bible? Like when you want to read the Bible, you're like, okay, here's what it says, but what do I do with this? How do I apply this to my life? Well, at Redemption, here's the way that we teach you to apply the Bible. If you're taking notes, write this down. This thought's going to guide our message for the day. We want you to read the Bible, and here's how we want you to understand it, that the Bible is a mirror and not a magnifying glass. What, what, What do you mean by that? Well, right here is a magnifying glass. We had to go through three stores to find a magnifying glass, and it doesn't have a handle, So, but that is a magnifying glass, okay? And so what people like to do when they read the Bible is they like to take it and read it like a magnifying glass where they, they read it, and then they like to look at other people and point out everybody else's problems. A magnifying glass will take somebody else's problems and it will magnify them and make them bigger. And then you'll be able to sit in the place of judgment over them. And then you can point the finger at everybody else's problems, faults, and flaws. So some people will read it and they go, oh, that's so terrible. Oh, you're so terrible too. Look at you. Look at you. Wow. Look at you. Okay. You're nasty. You're dirty. You're wrong. You're awesome. Not so much, not awesome, okay? And so we like to read the Bible and we'll take verses and then we'll begin to apply them to other people's lives. But that's not how we teach to read the Bible here. We don't want to read the Bible to apply it to somebody else's life. We want to read the Bible so that way we can apply it to our own lives. And so what I teach you is this. Instead of a magnifying glass, we want you to read the Bible like a mirror, So that way when we come to the scriptures and we look into the scriptures, not only do we see who Jesus is, but we also see ourselves for who we truly are. We want to read the Bible like a mirror. And we want to investigate and we want to be intentional and we want to think about not everybody else's problems, but we want to think about our own. We don't want to point out the faults and flaws and failures in other people, but we want to look in the mirror and we want to see ourselves for who we truly are. That's what the the Bible does. Now, let's be honest. People don't really like looking in the mirror, do they? Because the mirror shows you who you truly are. The mirror shows all of your imperfections. That's why whenever you wake up in the morning, your mirror is only this high right? Because it doesn't show you the the bottom half, right? And it's why when you go to the restroom, you kind of like look in the mirror and then you move forward. It's why when you go out, you know, to to buy clothes or you go out shopping or you go somewhere, like you see all the mirrors, you just walk really fast with your head down, right? Because we don't like looking in the mirror, but that's sometimes the reason we are the way that we are because we don't like looking in the mirror. I mean, when I look in the mirror, okay, I see myself and I'm like, ooh, Byron, you're looking a little older now. 
right? I mean, COVID-19 was the longest decade of my life. My hair is gray now. Like, I'm getting gray in my hair, gray in my beard. Oh, my hairline, my hairline's starting to recede. Uh, that's the stress of church planting, okay? Uh, and um, it looks like I have, like, something in my, my teeth, and I put on the COVID quarantine 15. I put on, like, 15 pounds in the last year. And the mirror will tell me all of that. And we don't like looking in the mirror because it shows all the faults and flaws and failures in ourselves. We would rather look at other people's lives. But the Bible doesn't afford us that. The Bible is not a magnifying glass to look at everybody else, but rather it is a mirror to be self-reflective and introspective about ourselves. And you say, Byron, why are you telling me all of this today? Here is the reason why. Because the sermon title for today is Jesus and Judas. We're going to look at the life of Judas and the choices and the decision that Judas made when he betrayed Jesus. And what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to take this text today and start looking at all the Judases around you. Look at how you failed me and how you disappointed me and how you betrayed me. I'm in a room filled with a bunch of Judases. They're the Judas in my life. They're so close to me, they can stab me in the front. I don't want you to get all like paranoid and neurotic and looking at other people's problems and all the other Judases around you. But rather what I want you to do is I want you to look into the mirror and realize this could be talking about me. I could be. A Judas, because the truth is, is if you want to spot a Judas, all you got to do is look in the mirror. And so we're going to look at the life of Judas and do a little character study on him. And I want you to put down the magnifying glass, pick up the Bible, and take a look in the mirror. If you have yours, turn with me to Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 43, as we look at Judas and Jesus. Verse 43, and immediately Mark's favorite word. 42 times. Here's exactly what happened. No fluff. All the stuff. Here we go. Mark's favorite word immediately. While he was still speaking, I don't know where that came from, but uh, Judas came, and there's our man Judas, bum, 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 one of the 12, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priest and the scribes and the elders. Now, the betrayer had given them a sign saying, there is one that I will kiss, seize that man, seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and they seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword, doesn't mention the name, I'll come back to that, and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. He wasn't aiming for the ear, by the way, okay? But he cut off his ear, and Jesus said to them, Have you come at me like a robber with swords and clubs and captured me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. At this point, it's the last week of Jesus' life. This is the last day of Jesus' life. This story is taking place at about 2, maybe even 3 o'clock in the morning on Friday night. By 3 o'clock that afternoon, within 12 hours, Jesus will be hung on a cross, crucified, and died. It's the last day. And what do they do? They arrest him under the cover of night because this is not a trial. This is an execution. And all week long, he's been doing what? Teaching in the temple. He comes in in the triumphant entry, goes into the temple. They don't arrest him. The next day, he goes and flips over the tables, drives out the money changers. They still don't arrest him. The following day, he preaches about a 10-hour sermon, get in fights with the religious leaders and the temple controversies. They still don't arrest him. When do they wait? Under the cover of dark because they don't want to be overt. Rather, they would rather be covert when it comes to their betrayal of Jesus. They're waiting to do it illegally under the cover of dark to where nobody else will notice, just them. And he says, nevertheless, let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and they fled. All of the disciples, they fled. Everyone close to Jesus, they abandoned him. They betrayed him. Everyone ran away from him. Verse 40, 51, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him and he left the linen cloth and he ran away naked. Do you ever read the Bible? And come across some verses and you're like, why is that in there? That's weird, right? That's what 
we just saw in verse 51. I mean, it's the most pivotal moment in all of the book of Mark, probably in all of the Gospels. If not, it is the climax for the entire unfolding drama of redemption of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. This is the climax of the plot storyline of the Bible, and Jesus is being betrayed by Judas. His disciples are abandoning him. There's a big crowd of Roman soldiers and Jewish leaders who are there to arrest him. Peter pulls out a sword, chops off a dude's ear, and we're seeing Jesus being dragged away. And then all of a sudden, here's what we see, verse 51, a young man streaking butt naked through the garden. You're like, what? Why, why, is, why is that in there? Sometimes you read the Bible and you're like, huh, that's interesting. Why is that in there? Well, God wastes nothing and everything's in there for a reason. Let's back up to Mark Chapter 1, verse 1. Sermon 1, 60 sermons ago in this series where I told you who the author of the book of Mark is. Now, pop quiz redemption. Let's do a little Bible trivia here. Who was the author of the book of Matthew? Who was the author of the book of Luke? Who was the author of the book of John? Who was the author of the book of Mark? It was not Mark. You're like, what? No, it might have came through Mark's hand, but it was actually Peter that Peter was the source for the book of Mark. Here's what church tradition tells us. Church tradition tells us that Mark, um, his mother actually had a church in her house. In the book of Acts, his mother would open her home up for prayer meetings, for Bible studies, for the early church, and Peter was their pastor. John Mark later became a missionary, hooked up with a man named Paul, and they began traveling around, planting different churches. After that kind of went south, Peter ended up in Rome, where he's the bishop of the church at Rome, and then Mark becomes Peter's assistant. And as Peter is retelling and reliving the story of the gospel, he's communicating all of this to Mark, who's writing it all down and eventually becomes the, the book of Mark. Peter is the source, but Mark he actually gets the credit. If you want to understand who Mark is, kind of think like Mark is Peter's Trevor. That's who Mark is. Okay, Mark is Peter's Trevor. And so Peter's telling him the story and Mark is writing it all down so that way we can still have it to this day here in downtown Beaumont at Redemption, still studying 60 sermons in the gospel of, of Mark. And what church tradition would tell us is that um, during the Last Supper, it actually took place at Mark's house. That when you read in Mark chapter 14 where it says, go find me a man with a clay pot filled with water and ask him if the upper room is prepared for Passover so I can celebrate it with my friends. That, that man was John Mark's dad. And so as a little boy, he would have been there on the last day of Jesus' life. He probably saw them eating and breaking bread and having Passover meal. He probably saw the woman who anointed Jesus and broke the flask and watched all of these things happen. As a little boy, you know, in kids' ministry, he was watching all of the disciples and he heard them sing a hymn like we saw last week. And then Jesus get up and go out to the garden of the Gethsemane. He probably saw all of that and then his mom was like, hey boy, you need to go to bed. And so he put his jammies on, went and laid in bed. And then Judas slipped out to go betray Jesus. We saw that last week. Judas uh, gathers a, a large crowd of Roman soldiers and, and, and leaders and officials, and he goes to betray Jesus, most likely, just using a little deductive reasoning, he probably first brought them back to, to the upper room. And all that commotion of a, a, a group and a crowd and guards probably woke John Mark up, and when he realized, Judas that is, Jesus wasn't there, they knew that he was in the garden, and so they left John Mark's house, and they went into the garden, and John Mark was awake. And John Mark woke up, and he probably snuck out, like some of y'all did when y'all were young men, right? Snuck out of his mom's house and followed Jesus very closely down to the garden. And he witnessed and he watched from a distance everything that was, was going on. And so when the great crowds, they came, and everyone starts fleeing, John Mark starts running, a guard seizes him, and, well, he doesn't have any drawers on. That's the story. <laughs> And so you're wondering, like, why, why is this, why, why are you telling me all this? Why is any of this important? Because at the end of their lives, Peter is telling John Mark the story and saying, I want you to write this down because to me, this is a very important moment. But don't put my name in it. <laughs> in fact, the book of Mark is the only gospel that does not name Peter as the dude who chops off the guy's ear. Okay? Peter's like, yeah, let's just not mention me. Let's just say someone cut off 
one of their ears. And John Mark's like, that someone was you. And he's like, don't worry, nobody's going to know. And then Matthew, Luke, and John come along. They're like, it was Peter. Peter did it. Peter did it. And he's like, ah, oh, dang it. And so Mark's like, I'll just not leave your name. But then Peter, he's like, John Mark, why don't you tell them what you did? I don't want to tell them. No, 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 put that in there. It's important. When you were running around butt naked in the garden, like, why don't you go and put that in there too? He's like, all right, fine. Someone cut off his ear, and a young man not named Mark ran through the garden naked. <laughs> they say, why is any of this important? Why are you telling me? Number one, to show you that the Bible is not boring, amen? amen. And then number two, to show you is that Judas wasn't the only betrayer in the garden that day. They're looking back on their lives, and they're realizing I betrayed Jesus that night too. They're reading the Bible not as a magnifying glass to say, look at Judas, look how horrible and terrible Judas was. Judas betrayed Jesus. But rather, they're reflecting, looking back, and they're writing the Bible as a mirror. I betrayed Jesus too. Everyone fled. Everyone ran. Peter sinned against Jesus. Just a few verses earlier, he said, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And what does he end up doing? Running away from his Savior. What does Mark do? Mark does everything he can to distance himself from Jesus as much as he can. In verse 50, it tells us they all fled. Every single one of them, every single disciple, every single follower of Jesus. Judas wasn't the only betrayer in the garden that day. Peter betrayed Jesus. Mark betrayed Jesus. All of the disciples betrayed Jesus. Judas betrayed Jesus. And here's what the point of the text is about for us today. The point is not to look at all the other Judases around us, but to look in the mirror and see the Judas inside us. There is a Judas in all of us, and we will not discover unless we take time to look in the mirror. So what I want to do today is I, I want to teach this text as a cautionary tale, as, as a warning, as a, as a mirror for us to reflect into our lives and say, could this be me? Because if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. There is a Judas inside all of us. When we Betray Jesus, that's, that's our inner Judas. When we live in secrecy, that's our inner Judas. When we harbor bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, that's our Judas. When we give in to sin and to temptation, when we continue to nurse hurts and wounds and unrepentant sin, when we live our lives that way, that is the Judas inside of us. And so instead of looking at the Judas around us, take inventory, look into the mirror, reflect on your heart and your mind and your soul and your life and recognize there is a Judas inside of me too. And so what I want to do is I, I want to just do a character study over the life of Judas and I want to close with five reflections that we can learn from Judas and begin to apply it to our lives. Because this text is not a magnifying glass. What is it? It's a mirror to show us not only who Jesus is, but also to show us who we are. So the first thing that I want you to see is this, is that Jesus gave Judas a chance. The, the, the first thing we see is, is that Judas had a chance. We all have a chance. What is God's desire? That none shall perish, but that all shall have everlasting life. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he sent his son that whoever believes in him, will have everlasting life. If you're here today, I want you to know that Jesus brought you here through the Holy Spirit, led you to this church today because he wants for you to know that you have a chance. Two words, change your life. Follow me. Those are the words Judas heard. Those are the words that Jesus is still repeating to us, that you have a chance. Salvation is available to all who hear. Judas had a chance. You have a chance. Look at the chance that Judas had. Mark 3.13. The first time we meet Mark, uh, Judas rather, and he, that's Jesus, went up unto the mountain, and he called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him, and they anointed the twelve, and he appointed the twelve, which he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority and to cast out demons. And he appointed the twelve. Here's the list of the twelve. Here's what we see. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. 
James, son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, which is also a really cool nickname because it means the sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Altheus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. After a long night of prayer, Jesus comes down from the mountain, getting alone with God, and he hand selects 12 men who are going to be his disciples, later named as apostles, who are going to be the future leaders of the church, transform and change the world forever. Today, Christianity is a movement of about 3.5 billion people across the planet, every tribe, tongue, nation. There's men and women and children just like you gathering in a church, worshiping Jesus today. 2,000 years ago, 12. What today is a movement of 3.5 billion started as 12 men on the side of a mountain, hand-selected, chosen by Jesus to be his disciples. And you know who made the cut? Judas did. Jesus chose Judas. It says here, he called them, why? Because he desired them. Jesus desired a relationship with Judas. See, Judas didn't start off bad. See, that's what we look, we look backwards and we're like, oh, he was horrible. He didn't start off bad. He was chosen by Jesus, hand selected. Could you imagine how stoked Judas must have been on that day? Like Jesus comes down the mountain and is like, I'll take you, 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 you. And you. And Judas is like, I made the team. I made the cut. Jesus chose me. Jesus appointed me. Jesus selected me. Jesus gave me a chance. You know how excited he must have been on that day? And think about all of the opportunities that he got along with this. I mean, number one, his pastor was Jesus. He's the best pastor in the world. His Bible teacher was Jesus. I mean, if he wanted to, like, understand the Bible... All he had to do was go ask Jesus because Jesus is the point of the whole Bible. I mean, if he's like, hey, Jesus, I'm just having a hard time understanding Daniel. Like it says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire, but there's a fourth man in the fire. Who was that? Jesus was like, that was me. <laughs> I, I, I don't understand, like, you know, um, like why would, why would Abraham have to sacrifice his son? What was the point of that story? And Jesus was like, I'm the point of that story. I don't understand the six-day creation. Like, how did God make the world in six days? And Jesus is like, let me tell you how I made the world in six days. Like, if he wanted to understand that, he just had to go to Jesus. Think about the opportunity that he had there. He had the best pastor, the best Bible teacher, went to the best seminary. What seminary did you go to? JCU, Jesus Christ University. Right? And that's, that's Judas, the opportunity that he had. I mean, when Jesus was preaching sermons, people thought it was confusing. They didn't understand the parables that he taught. But if you were Judas, then you actually got inside access to the teachings of Jesus. The crowd didn't understand the parables, but he always got alone with the disciples and said, here's what the four soils mean. He got inside access to the teachings of Jesus. He got behind the scenes. Whenever Jesus would heal someone, Judas got front row seats. Whenever Jesus walked on water, Judas was like, hey, look at that, water skiing without a boat. How did he do that? Whenever Jesus calmed the storm, Right? Judas was in the boat with him. Whenever Jesus fed the multitudes, Judas was the one passing out the fishes and the loaves. Whenever the woman with the issue of blood reached her hand out, touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and instantly was healed, Judas is like, well, would you look at that? That's interesting. Judas saw all of the miracles that Jesus did. Do you imagine the chance that Jesus gave him? But not only the opportunities that he saw, but also the opportunities that he had. Because here in this text, what do we see? That Jesus called them to himself, but he also sent them with authority to preach sermons, heal the sick, and cast out demons. Judas had that. Judas preached sermons. I bet they were banger sermons too. I bet when Judas stood up to preach, I bet it was powerful. I bet he opened up with an illustration with a, on the stage as he was preaching. I bet he did that. I bet when he, he preached, he had three points, four sub points, and a closing statement that made you cry. I bet his sermons were shorter than mine, by the way, but anyway, whatever. Um, so I bet he was a wonderful preacher. I also, he gave him to heal. G Judas performed miracles. He prayed for the sick. He saw them be healed. Judas even cast out demons. Mark chapter 6, 
We read that Jesus sent out the 72. They come back and they're like, Jesus, this was amazing. We preached sermons. People repented. We prayed for the sick. They got healed. We even cast out a few demons. It's a great day today. Judas did that. And in Mark chapter 3, we see the introduction of Judas, where he started, the opportunity that he was given, and the chance that he had. But then we see in Mark chapter 14 how it ended, which really goes to show this, is that the last day is the most important day of your life. It doesn't matter how well you start. What matters is how well you finish. The last day is the most important day of your life. Judas started really good, but it didn't end very well for him. The last day is the most important day of your life. Now, we love new beginnings. We love fresh starts. We love second chances. We live in a society that loves everything new. This is why every time Windex or Clorox comes out with a new brand, they just put new on it. People are like, wow. Every time a new iPhone comes out, they just put iPhone 12.17. And you're like, oh, man, I got to go spend $1,000 to go buy it. Does it do anything different? No, but it's new. Like we have a society that just loves new. We love hearing stories of things that are new and fresh starts and fresh beginnings. But can I tell you, new is good, but faithfulness is better. The last day is the most important day of your life. It doesn't matter how it starts. It matters how it ends. Just think about it. There's a saying in athletics that says past performance is not an indicator of future success. How many times have we seen someone get drafted into baseball or to the NFL or to the NBA out of high school, given a million-dollar contract, three years later they're working at Enterprise Rent-A-Car? Because... Because they got hurt, they got injured, or they couldn't work well with other people, and they couldn't stay on the team, and they didn't save their money and budget well and make good investments, and they end up right back where they started. Past performance is not an indicator of future success. We see this at the same time with relationships. People get engaged, they get married. Oh, it's so beautiful. And they have a nice big fairy tale wedding. They go on a romantic vacation, honeymoon. Three years later, they're divorced. Because the purpose of marriage is not to get married, but to stay married. The last day of your life is the most important day. The last day of your marriage is the most important day of your marriage. It's not a matter of how well it starts. It's a matter of how will it end. We even see this in the church. In the church, people come to Jesus, bow their head, pray a prayer, raise their hand, walk an aisle, maybe even get baptized, join a small group, get on a serve team. Three months, three years later, they go gone. You say, well, what happened? The last day was the most important day. The first day is great. We'll celebrate your first day. But what we worry about the most and what we're most concerned about is the last day of your life. Judas started out great. Judas had every single chance. But the second thing we see is that Judas made a choice. Our life is a culmination of the choices that we make. We live in a society where everybody likes to blame other people for their problems, but they don't want to take responsibility for themselves. Judas made a choice. Judas, you wonder, how did it happen for Judas? Well, Judas made a choice. You can't blame other people. It was, it was his pastor's fault. His pastor was Jesus. No, it was his church's fault. No, it was, um, it was he had the 12 disciples as his church. It was a small groups. You want to, like, oh, it, he had the best small group. I mean, Peter wrote two books of the Bible. John wrote five books of the Bible. Judas had to make his own choices. Judas made his decision, and his life is a culmination of the choices that he made. Actually, the Bible straight up tells us that Judas was looking for this opportunity. Look at Mark 14. Judas Iscariot, verse 10, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priest. This is a few weeks ago we studied this. Went in in order to do what? To betray him. And when they heard it, they were glad, and they promised to give him money. And here's what we saw. He sought the opportunity to betray him. Judas had a chance, but Judas also, he made his choice. At this point, commentators, they want to wonder, why did Judas make this decision? Why did Judas do this? And they'll they'll speculate with a bunch of different reasons. One speculation is that Judas was what is known as a zealot. That is a Jewish anarchist who was opposed to the Roman government, wanted to set up a a, a kingdom of Israel on earth, overthrow Rome, defeat Caesar, and usher in their own new king. That was the zealots. 
And Jesus comes along, and Jesus is king. Jesus is the Messiah. Judas is like, that's my guy. And then as the story unfolds, what do we see? Three times, Jesus says, the son of man, that's a messianic title, will be betrayed, denied, hand over, and crucified dead, and three days later, he'll resurrect. Judas clicked. Uh, Jesus isn't the Messiah that I've been looking for. Because he's not going to set up an earthly kingdom. He keeps talking about this heavenly kingdom. And that's not what I'm in for. And so Judas probably betrayed Jesus because he realized there was no benefit in following him anymore. Uh, and that's possible. Another reason people suggest that Judas made this decision is because he was greedy. He was a thief. We're going to look at that in detail in just a moment. But the entire time Judas was following Jesus, he was the CEO. He was the bookkeeper or the treasurer of the disciples. And every time someone would give money, Judas would take a little bit for himself. And as he realizes the cross is before him, he's going to be unemployed. And so he betrays Jesus to collect a nice good payday before he has to go get back in the unemployment line. And so he just cashed Jesus in. The other reason that they'll suggest that Judas did it is because he was jealous. You say, well, how, how do you know that? Because there was an inner circle of disciples, Peter, James, John. Judas wasn't invited into the inner circle. And so he became jealous of the other disciples. They got insider, they got better access, they got better seats than I did. They got closer to Jesus than I did. And so he became envious, became bitter, and he became jealous against them. Because Peter, James, and John, they were allowed to go into the room with Jairus' daughter being raised. Judas didn't get to go. Whenever Jesus went up to the Mount of Transfiguration in Mark chapter 10, what do we see? We see Peter, James, and John, Moses, Elijah, Jesus, Judas, down on the mountain. Didn't get to go up to it. And even at the Last Supper, as he's sitting there watching all this unfold, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. Guess who got to go deeper into the garden with Jesus? Guess who was watching over Jesus? Peter, James, and John. Judas was not. And so what some commentators will speculate is that he allowed bitterness, unforgiveness, resentment, to build inside of his heart, eventually to the point out of envy, he had Jesus being murdered. You say, well, which one is it? I think it could be all three. See, the Bible doesn't tell us why Judas did it. It only tells us what he did. And I'm grateful that the Bible doesn't tell us why he did it. You know why? Because if we knew why, we could excuse ourselves. We could compartmentalize our minds and we could disassociate ourselves from any responsibility of our own lives. We could read it and say, oh, well, at least I didn't do that. I'm not a Judas. The Bible doesn't tell us because it's open for interpretation. Any of us could be one. It forces us to not only wrestle with the text, but to reflect on ourselves and ask this question, could this be me? And could I be guilty of doing the exact same thing? if I don't look in the mirror and take an inventory of my own life. The Bible does tell us some things about Judas. And here's three things that the Bible will tell us. First thing is this, is that Judas was a fraud. Do you remember just a few weeks ago when we looked at Mary breaking the alabaster jar, pouring out her worship, basically saying, Jesus is the most worthy possession that I own? That's a heart of what true worship is. And Mary had an alabaster jar filled with ointment, a perfume, that was worth 300 denarii. That's about $60,000 in today's economy. And she broke the flask, and she poured it out all over Jesus, an elaborate display of affection for Jesus. And you know what the disciples said? What a waste. We could have used that money for the poor. Do you know who was the disciple who said that? It was Judas. Here's Here's what John tells us. John 12, 5 says, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? That sounds very loving, doesn't it? We should give this money to the poor. We should go make a whole bunch of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and pass them out. Look at all the good that we could do. Why why do you need to tithe 10% to the church? You should give that money to the poor. Why does the church need to hire more staff? They should give that money to the poor. Why are you doing a people giving campaign to build a better and bigger building. You don't need to do that. Let's give the money to the poor. It sounds very good, doesn't it? Why would he say that? Uh, Because he was a fraud. Look at the next verse. He didn't care about the poor because he was a thief. He wanted the money for himself. And having charge of the money bag, he used it to help himself and to whatever was put into it. The entire time, he was using Jesus to abuse people. 
He wasn't a giver. He was a taker. He wasn't really serving other people. He was serving himself and really stealing from Jesus. He was a, he was a fraud. And I want you to understand something. Is that the church is an easy place for evil people to hide. You do understand that, right? Well, because the whole, the whole mindset of the church is we're marks, we're easy targets. Because you have to like love people and stuff. If somebody wrongs you, what do you have to do? Forgive them. If somebody slaps you on the cheek, you got to turn the other cheek. And people will see that. And Christians with an overactive conscience and feeling very guilty about themselves, they eventually just roll over and become doormats so other people can walk all over them. That's not the point of the scripture. That's not what Jesus is teaching. But that's what some people will do. They'll enter into the church, infiltrate the church, just like Judas infiltrated through the disciples to steal, to take, and to abuse. It's possible for people to come into the church and even join a serve team or join your small group and come over to your house and have dinner and fellowship with you, get really, really close to you, take from you, and stab you in the front. It's possible. Because the church is a great place. You would be surprised at some of the evil and the abuses that I have seen in the church. When me and Ashley first moved to Beaumont, there was a church plant here in downtown. They're gone now. But the the pastor, he was planting the church. They rented a facility. They were open for about a year. The entire time that church is open, they were stealing copper from the air conditioner vents. He was cashing it in. He was building the money. When the church started growing, people started tithing. Then eventually he took all of the church budget, all of the salaries, all of the money in the bank account, stole it, and ran off with the secretary, leaving the church confused. What just happened? I remember when I... One of my early sermons, I was traveling around preaching, and I went and visited a, a church in, in, in Dallas, and I preached this sermon, and the pastor cut me an honorarium check. It was the biggest preaching check I'd ever got. It was like $500. I'm driving back from Dallas, big smile on my face, stop at In-N-Out Burger, get me some good. And I'm driving back, and I'm feeling really good. Man, that's such a great church. That's such a great pastor. He took me out for lunch. He brought me in the back, only to find out three months later he was molesting two girls in the youth group in that same back room. Wicked in the church. That's why I hear stories of abuse, moral failures. Seems like every time we turn on the Facebook and we start scrolling through, there's some pastor who failed. There's some abuse allegation. There's some scandal that's taking place. And you wonder, how does this happen? Those pastors didn't start there. They started like Judas in Mark chapter 3, excited. Probably got into ministry, really happy, wanted to do some good. But over time, because they weren't walking with Jesus, they ended up doing the unthinkable in their lives. They became frauds. It's possible for all of us, if we're not close to Jesus, that this could be us. He was a fraud. The second thing we see is that he was a fake Look at this, this verse right here. We see this in Mark 14, 44. The one that I kiss is the man. Sees him, lead him astray, under guard. And when he came, he went up. And at once he kissed him. He said, Rabbi. And then mwah, gave him the kiss of betrayal. In the, in the Greek, that word kiss is the word phileo. It's where we get the term brotherly love. Like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sign of affection. It's a, it's a kiss. It's, today it's like a handshake, uh, you know, a, a knuckle bump. Like that's what it is today. It's, it's a high five. That, that's what they would do in that day. They would, they would kiss, okay? Um, and, and so he says, the one that I kiss is the one. Go ahead and seize him. And then he calls him rabbi. It's teacher. And then he goes in and he doesn't give him a kiss with the phileo, but rather in the Greek it's the kata phileo. Kata is a word that means passion, over-the-top enthusiasm. The only other time the word kata is used is when Mary broke the alabaster flask and anointed Jesus and kissed his feet. 
But what we see here is that on one hand, Mary was passionate about her worship. Judas was pretending about his. He's a fake. He goes up and he says, Rabbi, Jesus, you're my best friend. You're my teacher. Everybody around him is watching him. He rolls into the garden. He's like, what's up, Jesus? And then he goes, and he doesn't just give him a little peck on the cheek. He starts pouring out devotion on him. He hugs him. He brings him in really close, gives him a kiss on the cheek. Jesus, my rabbi, my teacher, oh, I love you. Release, betrayed. You need to understand something. It is possible for people to fake it. It's even possible for you to fake it. It's possible. Do you know that it's possible for people to say they're one thing and then not actually be that thing? I know in the age of the internet, that's hard for you to believe. It's 2021, people say a lot of things. But it's possible for people to say they're one thing and then not actually be that thing. Okay, I'll just give you an example. I am a ballerina. You say, no, you're not. How do you know? Have you ever seen me do ballet? You've never seen Bruce Wayne and Batman at the same place. So, I mean, like, you know, have you ever seen me do ballet? For those who know me the best also know that I'm about as flexible as a two-by-four. <laughs> and so as I get a little bit older, I drop something. I'm like, yeah, I'm not getting that. Um, <laughs> But just because I profess something, what's the difference? Practice. Some people profess a faith they don't actually possess nor practice. It's possible for people to be fakes. Listen, we are not saved by lip service. What God is after is genuine life change. And Judas was following Jesus but over the course of the three years, his life didn't change. It might have looked different, but it never changed. He professed a faith that he never actually possessed. It's possible for people to be fakes. It's possible for people to be frauds. And it's dangerous for you and me. Because it's really easy for people to come into church, to raise their hands in worship while their hearts are far from God. It's really easy for you to even come down front during the, the altar time at First Wednesday prayer night and you can get down on your knees and you can cry real tears and you can be very sincere. And you know what? You can fool everyone around us, but you can't fool God. This is why at the Last Supper, Jesus passing around the dish, he who dips his bread in here will betray me. Every single one of the disciples said, is it me? Could it be me? Judas dips his in. Go and do what you have to do. Because Judas fooled everyone around him, but he didn't fool Jesus. It's possible for you to, to be a fraud, for you to say one thing and then for you to do another thing. It's possible for you to listen to your worship music turned up to 11. You can hashtag blessed and put a Bible verse in your bio and you can still be completely far from God. Judas Right next to Jesus, so close to Jesus, he betrayed him with a kiss. And he was a fraud. You can betray Jesus with your hands raised and still dripping wet from baptism water. At this point, some of you are wondering, you're, you're, you're wondering right now, does this mean that I can lose my salvation? Does this mean that I can make a decision for faith and then three years later I can walk away? Does this mean that I can lose my salvation? Here's what I believe. I do not believe that you can lose your salvation, but I do believe that you can fake it. Growing up in Southeast Texas, very easy for a lot of people to fake it. You were raised in church. You went to Awana's, nice little Southern Baptist praying grandma. You went to all of the Easter and all of the Christmas. You were in the Christmas pageant. You switched over to a Pentecostal church and you went to for revival fire youth night and that Pentecostal pastor prayed over you. You got filled with the Holy Ghost. You're running laps around the sanctuary. You made a decision. You did all these things. And you know what? You can have all of those experiences just like Judas. And you cannot actually be in Christ. That's my story. 
raised in the church, knew all of the Bible verses, but I wasn't actually saved until I was about 20 years old. Fake. I had everybody fooled, but I was a fake. I do not believe that you can lose your salvation, but I do believe that there are people who fake it. Here's what Jesus says in John 17. It's the high priestly prayer. It's the upper room moment. It's the prayer that Jesus prays. It's John's version of the Garden of Gethsemane. And here's what it says. While I was with them, he's talking about his disciples. While I was with them, I kept them in your name. We don't earn our salvation, so we can't lose our salvation. Salvation is a free gift that comes from God. It's not merited. It's not favor that we perform on our own, but it's favor that we receive from God, that we are saved by grace through faith for the glory of God and for our own good, that Jesus not only saves us, but he has guarded us. He has kept us in his name. And then I have not lost one of those except for the son of destruction. So the scripture may be filled. Who's the son of destruction? That's Judas. Because Judas wasn't with him to begin with. Judas might have been close to Jesus, but he wasn't with Jesus. Judas might have been working for Jesus, but he wasn't actually walking with Jesus. From the beginning, he wasn't actually with them. He knew the Bible, but he didn't believe it. He had lip service, but he didn't have any life change. He wasn't saved. He was a fake. Lastly, we see is that Judas was a fool. Here's how, here's how the story unfolds. Matthew 27, 3. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and to the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is it to us? See it to yourself. 30 pieces of silver. You know what that is? That's the price of a slave. In the book of Exodus, that was the cost of, of a slave. That's all Jesus was worth to Judas at the end. It was just a couple of bucks. Feeling guilty about what he did, he runs back to the chief priest and says, I changed my mind. I don't want to do it. Here, take your money back. You know what they said? It's not our problem. You figure out what to do with it. Judas was using Jesus. They were using Judas. Player got played. He's a fool. Jim Elliott, the great missionary, he says, no man is a fool to give up what he cannot lose or give up what he can lose for what he cannot lose. Judas, the opposite. He's a fool. He gave up everything for nothing. Judas was a fool. And it's possible for you and me, given enough time to become a fake, to become a fraud, and to be a fool. Listen, nobody wakes up one day and just ruins their life. This is a slow burn of the hardness of Judas's heart throughout the three years he walked with Jesus. Like this is how the Puritans would say it. The Puritans, they write, that sin is like baiting a hook. Satan knows that you're not just going to go for the hook. Just like those of you who fish, right? You don't just drop a hook in the water because the fish ain't going to bite for that. Like if, if Satan was like, oh, hey, let me just drop adultery and divorce and heroin addiction and losing your kids. Let's just drop that in the water. You think anybody's going to take that? They're like, no, I'm going to swim away from that. Right? But he drops it in with greed, jealousy, envy, sex, Sin starts in the heart before it ever reaches the hands. And Judas was harboring all of this bitterness and unforgiveness in his heart towards Jesus, whether through greed, whether through envy. And over the three years he was walking with Jesus, his heart continually got harder until he couldn't resist the bait anymore. Nobody just wakes up and ruins their life. It's a process of being close to Jesus, but not actually being with him. Until eventually you fall for the lie, hook, line, and sinker. 
all that we see with Judas is what was on the inside was finally revealed on the outside. All of this was in here the entire time. And eventually, he couldn't conceal it anymore. And he made his own choice. You and me, we have to make our choices. Our lives are a culmination of the choices that we make. And we can't point the finger at other people. We have to look in the mirror at ourselves. And Judas betrayed Jesus because he was a fake, he was a fraud, he was a fool. Jesus had given him a chance, he made a choice, and now he has to face the consequences. What are the consequences of Judas' actions? It's the same consequences that we all face. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is it's death. Sin always leads to death. Nothing good ever comes from sin. Sin always kills. Jesus says, Satan, he comes to rob, steal, kill, and to destroy. He was a liar. He's been a liar from the very beginning. His native tongue is lies. And what Satan wants for you to do is to think that this sin is going to bring me happiness. This sin is going to bring me fulfillment. This sin is going to make me finally be the person I want to be. There's nothing wrong with it. Nobody's getting hurt. Nobody's going to know. Sin is not that big of a deal. Take a lesson from Judas. Death. Always, relational death. Sin between a husband and a wife, adultery, infidelity will kill the marriage. Sin against your children long enough, they won't talk to you when they're 24. Death in the relationships. Sin against your boss, steal some money from him, show up 20 minutes late for work for an entire week, don't do your job, death of your job. Sin always leads to death. Nothing good ever comes from sin. Take a lesson from Judas and the consequences that he faced. Here's what we read. Throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and he hung himself. You have two choices. The Judas inside of you has two choices. You either kill sin or sin will kill you. John Owen the Puritan, he writes, either be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Don't nurse your sin. Don't celebrate your sin. Don't tolerate your sin. Don't hide your sin. Don't cover up your sin. Don't pretend you don't have sin. Kill it. Because if you don't kill sin, eventually it will be exposed. It will catch up with you and it will destroy you. When Judas saw the greed in his heart, he had a choice. Kill it or kill me. He nursed it and nurtured it until it killed him. When Judas had the pride, the ego, the narcissism, when Judas saw the bitterness, resentment that was building up inside of him, sitting in the church week after week for three years, watching Jesus, but not actually following him. Eventually, it overwhelmed to the place to where it killed him. Either you kill your sin or your sin will kill you. Those are your options. There's two other people in this story. Judas wasn't the only betrayer in the garden that day. Who else do we see? Peter and Mark. How come their story is different than Judas? How come we're naming our kids Peter, we're naming our kids Mark, but nobody's naming their kids Judas? How come when we read the Bible, we're like, I want to be Peter. Nobody reads the Bible and they're like, I want to be Judas. Why is that? Why was their story ended up so differently? Because Peter and Mark, they made a decision to kill their sin. Judas went out and killed himself. What do we see here? We see here Peter writing this, saying, I betrayed Jesus. Put it in the book. Let the whole world know I betrayed him. John Mark's like, I did too. I'll go ahead and put my story in there. I ran away naked. But here's what we see as the story unfolds. We're going to have a whole sermon on Peter in a couple of weeks. Father's Day, come back. Jesus and Peter. And here's what we see that Peter did. Yes, he chopped off a dude's ear. Yes, he betrayed Jesus. Yes, he denied him. He cussed out a little girl and he ran away and he wept bitterly over what he had done. 
And when he hears that Jesus has resurrected, guess who the first person at the empty tomb was? It was John, because he was younger and Peter's old and his knees were bad. (laughs) But he ran to the empty tomb. He said, I got to see it for myself. I want to run to Jesus. I'm not going to run from him. I'm going to go to him. I'm not going to wait for him to come to me. I'm going to go to him. And Peter ran to that empty tomb. And he was the first one who jumped out of the boat to swim to the shore. And Jesus is cooking breakfast. And he looks him in the eyes and he says, Peter, do you love me? You know what Peter says? You know I love you. Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? See, Peter denied Jesus three times, so Jesus asks him three times just to restore him. Do you love me? He says, you know I love you. What's the difference between Peter and Judas? Peter put his sin to death. Judas let his sin be the death of him. This is the difference between repentance and remorse. Do you know repentance and remorse are different? On the surface, they look the same. But internally, they're very different. Remorse is where you feel bad. Repentance is where you change for the better. Remorse is where you feel sorry. Repentance is where you take ownership and change. See, this is how the gospel works. The gospel is this, that our entire lives is spent following after ourselves, our wants, our needs, our passions, desires, living our life apart from Jesus. Repentance is where we stop living for ourselves and start looking at ourselves in the mirror. And we see ourselves for our faults, flaws, and failures But then we see Jesus in all of his goodness, glory, and forgiveness. And instead of running from him, we run to him, and he changes us. The Puritans would call this living quorum Deo, living in the face of God. But for the sake of the illustration of this sermon today, I would say it's just living your life in the mirror, constantly reflecting on yourself, and seeing God begin to change you from the inside out. Because the truth is, there is a Judas in all of us and every single one of us have been given a chance, we've been given a choice, and we face the consequences of our actions. Jesus is here today to forgive you. And I believe that if Judas, instead of running out and getting a noose, would have waited just a little bit longer, he could have made it to that empty tomb and saw Jesus resurrect. And he could have been sitting by that fire with Peter. Do you love me? You know I do. But he made a choice. And you have to make a choice. And we all have to make a choice. So let me close with five reflections briefly from the life of Judas. The first thing I'll say is this is you can say all the right things and still have the wrong motives. You know it's possible for people to say the right things and then do the exact opposite of that? You can say all the right things and have the wrong motives. We need to feed the poor. Why? We need to take care of people. Why? I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying why? Check your heart. Check your motives. Are you doing out of selfish ambition, greed, or pride, or are you doing it because you really love to serve and bless other people? Number two is you can know the Bible and you can still not believe it. Information without application is deception. And you'll just be held more accountable to God for your rebellion. Sitting in church week after week, hearing the same sermon week after week, Not responding to the gospel or applying it to your life leads to a hard heart and judgment upon yourself. You can know the Bible, quote the verses, and you can still not believe it at all. 
The third thing we learn is this. You can go to church and still go to hell. We are not saved by our church attendance. We are not saved by our position on the serve team. We are not saved by hosting a small group. We are not saved by our denomination, by our tradition. We're saved by grace, through faith, not by our works, so that no one can boast. You can go to church. You can be raised in the church. You can be baptized in the church. You can get married in the church. You can have your funeral in the church. And you can close the casket, close your eyes, wake up in hell. Some of you are wondering, you've been through church before, you've been through church hurt, you've gone through spiritual abuse, and you've distanced yourself from the church, and you've wondered, Christians, how could a Christian do this? How could a church do this? Maybe they weren't Christians, maybe they were Judas. Maybe you're Judas. Fourth thing is this, you can be in ministry and you can still not be in Christ. For pastors, elders, deacons, church leaders, and those who desire leadership in the church, this should be like a kick in the soul. A lot of times people go into ministry because it makes it feel good about themselves. Seminaries are filled with people who are narcissists and don't really care about anyone other than themselves. It's possible that you could be in ministry. Look at all the things that I do. I'm a small group. I'm leading a serve team. I've traveled the world. I've been a missionary. I've been to Spain. I've been to Portugal. I went to South Africa. Jesus says, actually, teaching to the disciples, there are many who will prophesy in my name. Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons? Prophesy in your name. He'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You can be in ministry, full-time ministry. You can get paid by a church. And you don't have to love Jesus to do it. One thing that I have to check myself all the time, listen, I don't have to pray to preach a good sermon. You know that, right? I probably shouldn't say this on the live stream. We'll edit it out later, but I'm pretty good at preaching. I mean, I'm not the best, but I can point, I can put three points in an illustration in a closing that'll make you cry. Just like Judas did. I don't have to seek the Lord to preach a sermon. I could go online and steal it. I don't have to pray to be a pastor or a ministry leader. I can emotionally manipulate you, twist you, and make you feel really good about yourself. And if I'm not walking with Jesus because I'm too busy working for Jesus, I'm Judas. Being in ministry is not the same thing as being in Christ. And the fifth thing we see is this, is you can start well and you can still fall short. The last day is the most important day of your life. It doesn't matter how you begin. I was talking with a a, a young woman between services today. And she has a past of drug addiction and prostitution. And she has a past of just horrible abuse. And over the last year in COVID, she relapsed back into her addiction. And she comes forward with tears in her eyes. She wasn't raised in church. She didn't grow up in church. She doesn't know any of these Bible stories. And so this is her first time to actually hear a sermon over Judas. And she had tears in her eyes. And she came up to me with a big smile. She said, Pastor, I may not have started very good, but I'm going to finish well. I'm reminded of, off the top of my head, what Paul says in the book of Philippians, he who began a good work in you will see it to completion. God's not done with you. If you're not dead, God's not done. Finish strong. And this, for all of us, is a a mirror. And I want to close with a, a verse from another man. His name's David. It's another man who betrayed Jesus. And his betrayal, just like Judas, led to the death of an innocent man. Judas' betrayal led to the death of an innocent man. David's betrayal led to the death of an innocent man. And when confronted with his sin, he tore his clothes and he wrote the book of Psalms. And here's what he says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's anything grievous in me and lead me in the way. Here's what David did. Here's what Peter did. Here's what John Mark did. They got in the mirror and they say, God, search my heart. 
Because if you want to spot a Judas, the best way to do so is simply looking in the mirror. Because there's a Judas inside all of us. And if we're not constantly looking in the mirror of our lives saying, God, search my heart. Because I know that I don't see myself clearly. And I need your help so that I can finish well.